Um, I assume everybody can see that. Yes, we can. Fab. Okay, so I'll just um, start by introducing myself. I'm Kimberly Neve. Lovely to be here. Um, what's amazing is that all of you guys are experts, or at least know a lot about food environments and food systems. So there's um, a nice part of the introduction that I don't have to do. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be among such experts. I've been here for the last hour or so and um, some really impressive presentations. So very grateful to be a part of it. I work at the Center for Food Policy at City University, and um, I'm part of a wider group of researchers there, working with Corinna Hawkes in particular. And what I'd like to talk to you today about is where we've got a research methods brief, and we've looked at qualitative methods exploring lived experiences with a food environment focus and also a focus on informing policy, which in the last hour certainly has come to the fore is so, so important if you actually want to have change. And um, we have a nice brief for you um, that I authored with many other people and it's really trying to collate all the methods you could use um, or at least the, the highlighted methods that are useful for researching people's lived experiences. So I hope you find that useful and very much um, welcoming any questions later on. Let's see, okay, fab. Just as an outline then, I don't think I need to talk too much about food environments, um, but to show you a little bit about where this brief has originated and then go straight into some of the more juicy part of the methods. And um, really to come down to it, that lived experience importance is because if you really want to improve diets, you have to know what's going on on the ground. You have to know what will work in practice. And it really does come down to the person and the community level. Um, so what we like to do is really focus in on that and see, okay, where can we make changes that will not have any knock on effects that are negative, but really have a, a difference to people in the context that they're in. And Mark Spires at the center has started an international community of practice. Um, there is over 60 members from, I think about 12 different countries. It's global. And we have met periodically to talk about these four aspects. So, you know, the methods you can use, how to achieve policy impact, looking at food environment research, having that collaboration and seeing how it will work between researchers across countries, but also between researchers and policymakers. And um, there's a new branch of this to building that research capacity for early career researchers. So it's a really exciting community. And um, it's just it's just really great to really focus in on food environments and that connection with policy. Now, with that community, as you might see, this is the front page of the brief. Lots of authors here helping with this um, and some fantastic expertise. Some of you might even be here. <laughs> um, and to highlight that, we had members of the community of practice help us with this brief where we would devised it and put everything together, tried to categorize. But within it, you'll find lots of references, some really great case studies, some really good expertise from across the community. So this, this is me. The easiest way to find it probably is through my Twitter. So that's not really a shameless plug. It's also on the Center for Food Policy website um, under our publications. And um, if you want, it's on my Twitter just at the top as a pinned link. Um, otherwise, the full URL is down on the right. If you want to take a quick screen grab there. And um, what I'll show you now is the categorization that we decided upon. It was quite difficult to figure that part out and just kind of deep dive into what some of these methods are, their pros, their cons, why you might use them, um, what to be aware of as well. Okay, so we had three groups in the end. Um, this, this was difficult because many things overlap. What you'll find in group three is that you could use many of the methods in group one and two. Um, so please don't take this as any kind of defined line in the sand. This was just our way of understanding what use do these methods have and what exactly are they doing? What are we using them for? So we had group one where you're exploring experiences, perceptions, beliefs um, and practices, but also social networks came into that. And then with group two, observing people and practices there and then, and be it with them knowing, uh, so you're part of their group or from a distance. And then group three is really, really participatory communication between you know, researchers and participants being key and their 
involvement as well in the research. And that was designing, you know, policy and interventions with them. So that's where the real policy focus comes in. There's a real end game to uh, research methods in group three. Now, group one, I think if you look on the left, we all know about individual interviews. I think we're pretty well versed with focus groups. You normally see interviews and focus groups with qualitative research. And there's a good reason for that. They give you a lot of information in a short amount of time. Less time intensive means less expensive. But visual methods shouldn't be ignored and they can be really helpful to explore in interviews as well. So photo elicitation, for instance, is something that um, we do in a few of our studies. And I'm just wrapping up a study now uh, on infant feeding. And we've been talking to lots of one dad, but mostly mums on infant feeding practices or the influences. But part of that, we've asked them to take some photos and discuss them with us. And they're such a nice springboard for discussion. You can really see products and packaging, for instance, with that food environment focus that we have. Um, and people sort of often, when taking the photos, start to think a little bit more about what they're doing or why they're doing it. And they start, that reflection can be quite helpful in interviews where they go into more detail or they take photos of things they might have otherwise forgotten. But what is worth bearing in mind, and it is down at the bottom with the be aware of, um, you know, a photo doesn't mean reality. Someone saying, you know, we had this on Saturday doesn't mean they eat that every week or every day. But it is an insight and it can be, like I say, really good springboard for discussion. And visual methods in general, I'd really recommend if you're working with how to engage groups or kids, because I used to be a teacher um, and it's certainly a really great way in because it's just less boring for, for some people than just talking. Some people love talking. Um, and in that sense, you've got more engagement and it's more accessible, of course, because if you don't have to write or put things into words necessarily, um, there can it can be helpful to, to bring down some barriers there that people may have in terms of literacy or just engagement and interest. Um, and with the creative arts, I mean, that doesn't just mean drawing, that could be theatre, that again works really quite well with small children. Um, videos have been really successfully used. Uh, timelines, you know, what's happened when actually can be a really good way to structure an interview, for instance, you could go in and out of certain parts on the timeline. So I really recommend visual methods where you can include them if they make sense, because it really helps you get a, a rounder picture. And I mean, all honesty, I mean, we, we provide reports to our Department of Health and Social Care. We're very lucky to have um, a research team that I work in called the Obesity Policy Research Unit. And we have a direct in with the government, which is um, really quite lucky. And it does help reports. I mean, policymakers are very used to reading lots of things. We know that. But isn't it better when there's a photo or there's a visual, or there's something to hook you in? Um, it certainly does help make reports more engaging and bring them to life quite literally. Someone might be able to relate more to a picture or at least see, OK, that's what they're talking about here. And um, then moving on to geospatial methods, again, one that people may not have used as much or certainly increasingly used with food environment research. But previously more used to be in like geography, environment um, fields. And it's kind of what it says on the tin. It's using geography and space. So maps, mapping out where people go, um, the routes that they take. And it could be using GPS. It could be that people do that um, where they do a bit of a map themselves. But normally there's some kind of geotagging, so a GPS to really see what's going on and where. And photos could be supplemented to say, OK, this is what you can see at each location. Bearing in mind with that one, um, I think what can cause barriers, certainly I found this, uh, we planned a research project using wearable cameras, which is different from this, um, but they had GPS in as well. So it does have some ethical um, barriers, so a couple more hoops potentially to jump through if you're doing an ethics application and um, can be expensive if you can't get hold of them. So the technology there may be the issue, but it is something that can really add again to help you triangulate data. It certainly helps with mapping a bit more effectively because I do find that people sat in a group or sat with a piece of paper saying, you know, can you map your journey from here to school or here to your workplace would actually find that quite hard. So um, it's certainly an area to explore a little bit more. 
And as I've said, I mean, there's a lot more detail on all of these methods in the brief, the benefits, the drawbacks, things to consider, but also some targeted case studies where they've actually been used effectively. So that can be good for further reading because I'm sure we don't all have tabs full and massive reading lists already. Um, so moving on to group two then with observation. This includes, as you can see on the right hand side, um, when people, like I've said before, you know, they know you're part of the group. It could be that you take part in a workshop or a community practice or um, I don't part of a food hub, food uh, bank as well. Or it might be non-participant where perhaps you're watching a video of how people go through the checkout, for instance, in terms of food environments. And it can be really useful actually to get that data where people don't know they're being watched. Um, that can be quite objective in terms of, obviously it's up to the researcher to interpret, but seeing if it matches up with what they tell you in an interview, for instance. Um, and go along tours can be useful here. So what we've done before is you go along with somebody. And in this case, uh, we went to a supermarket with them and they talk you through their food shop. So what they're picking up and why. And the transect walk is very similar, but along with that, you add um, a little bit more detail basically about the food environment that they're in. It includes a map of where they're going, what they're seeing in that area, the opportunities and potentially barriers to healthy eating in that route. Um, Things to, be, things to bear in mind, though, with those go along tours, if you're in a supermarket, you know, where the microphone, there's some practical elements, like where the microphone is, um, and what sound you can pick up. There is the obvious question of, you know, would people not buy the same things because you're there? Um, so I definitely recommend with that one that you do an interview beforehand or you, you have some kind of input with them or kind of um, interaction with them beforehand because it would be really quite strange someone just kind of tagging along with you to your supermarket shop and you're more likely to act a little bit differently if you don't know that person, um, that researcher. So I would get some kind of um, rapport going beforehand um, before doing one of these and adding on some kind of mapping to it could be ideal as well. But it depends what you want to get out of it. It might not be that you want to know what they're buying because quantitative data could tell you that, you like a receipt. But it's more about... Um, well, we found more useful, you know, what's going on in your head as you buy it? Are the kids picking something up? Because you then have also the aspect of observation from you as a, a you know, on in the field. And can you see the kids picking something up that they've said they don't really eat very much of, but you can see the kid putting it in the trolley. <laughs> um, so again, it just helps to round out the data that you're getting. Moving on to group three. This is a huge group and um, certainly one that gave us <laughs> it's the trickiest group for sure in terms of categorization. And an example there is photo voice. Photo voice is not the same as photo elicitation and it shouldn't be. It is very much a community based um, participatory method. And although we nearly put it in group one, um, it fits here because the idea with photo voice is that you work with community members, they take photos of their local area and they come back and potentially there's a workshop, there's some kind of activity where together they give captions to the photos, there's an exhibition afterwards if you can. And ideally decision makers, policy makers are then invited to the group and the discussion is, you know, what's going on in our food environment? What do we see as the challenges, for instance, or what would we like to be changed? And it's there, it's visual, there's discussion about it amongst members of the community. And then that can be taken a, a level up with the policy makers. Um, and a really powerful way to do it too, where you have a photo exhibition that people can be proud of and find engaging. Again, you want your research to be engaging because the people you want it to get to, in our case, it's, it's policy makers, we want change. And they're just people, so they have attention spans like you and me, and they want to be told stories. And that's what lived experience research does. It provides stories, but it's really important to show that that story isn't just, oh, it's just that person, so it doesn't matter. It's, it's relatable, it expands to other people. There's connections there, there's things to draw out that would help everybody. Um, so look then at consensus mapping. What you'll, <laughs> so with these, we could have added a few more in here. Um, sorry, consensus panels, essentially that's where researchers bring a group of community leaders and members together and 
they work together to set the research agenda in question, um, shaping that project then from the beginning. But the idea of the consensus panel is that's kind of at the beginning, maybe at the end, and then not so much in between. Whereas if you come down to the co-design and co-create, it depends how you want to define them. How we've tried to do that here is that co-design is part of a co-create process. Essentially, though, together, especially because terminology is very um, interchangeable between them when you look at the, the literature, of which there isn't a huge amount. And a colleague of mine, Jess Brock, really helped with this part because she is an expert in um, co-design and co-create. Really, it comes down to the participants being so much part of the research that they're like researchers. They're not just there at the beginning to say, oh, this is what we think you should research. They're not just there at the end to say, oh, we agree with the findings um, and working for those policy recommendations. They are part of the research by, you know, actually interviewing or doing the research, interviewing people, collecting data themselves, and then analyzing it themselves too. Obviously, in partnership with researchers who have the experience and then working towards you know the end goal of what recommendations would we have here as well so it's a really participatory process and therefore time consuming and um hard to do well i'd say but it's it's so much more in depth in terms of the insights that you can get it's very much worth thinking about and they would then combine lots of the methods in this document, it could be that there's group one, group two methods in there, there's some observation, there's some, a few interviews, there's a few, you know, you could really combine anything as part of a co-create process. And what you find as well, um, in terms of designing policy and interventions with participants, there's normally a mapping activity. And for instance, systems mapping is a very straightforward way to do that, where participants from the local community, um, could be the area, just the workplace or a school, it doesn't matter what that community is, it doesn't have to be a village, it could be, you know, a school. And, um, you know, members from different levels then work together to map their local environment, and in this case, you know, their local food environment, what is available, where, at what time of day. And then the idea is to get the feedback loops, it's a big mind map, really. Um, and it's similar to the concept mapping uh, that we've seen in visual methods. And it also forms part of group model building. It's only the first stage of group model building. You, you build the map. What is the situation at the moment? Where can we see levers for change? What could be changed? Uh, where can we see the main issues? What are people saying um, more about or less about? And with group model building, you get people together. Again, community members, but more decision makers, technical experts and researchers too. And it's a facilitated process. So it's used um, with several scripted group exercises. It could be a mapping, it could be a ranking exercise, it could be um, a guided kind of focus group discussion. And it's normally the first stage then in a longer process to identify and evaluate systemic options for intervention. So really looking at the systems level. And like I say, it normally then forms part of a co-design or co-create process. Um, I think I'm doing okay for time, actually. I'm whizzing through this, and I'm sorry if it's too fast. Um, it's really just to give you an overview. So I'll come back up to the methods we've got, how we've categorized them. That may be interesting. There might be methods in here you haven't seen or you'd like to explore more. So I encourage you to go to the document and just check it out. There's more detail there, the references and the case studies too. But really the advocacy is that qualitative methods can be so important for policy making because without knowing the reasons why people are doing things or how, you could really draw the wrong conclusion from numbers on their own. And it's not to say that qualitative should be used alone either. Very much appreciate that mixed methods would be ideal in, I think, most research studies. Um, but it's not that qualitative methods complement the quantitative. I think they really are in balance. They can work very powerfully together. And um, mixed methods would be brilliant. We just did not have the space or the time to include those here too. So this is a focus on the lived experience methods, the qualitative qualitative. Nope, qualitative methodologies. Um, so I will, I will 
bring that to a close there. And thank you very much for your time. Um, please check out the brief and open to any questions later on. <laughs>